Hello, my name is Alice Schock. I'm a librarian for the Art, Music, and Recreation Department at the Los Angeles Public Library, and I'm here to introduce today's LA MADE program. First, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping to bring the LA MADE programs to you virtually. I hope everyone checks out our online calendar at lapl.org. There are so many amazing offerings, such as tomorrow's Your Author program at 4 p.m., with children's author Matthew Cordell discussing his book, Hello Neighbor, The Kind and Caring World of Mr. Rogers. Those viewing may also be able to receive his book in an opportunity drawing. Also, the next LA Made program will feature the making of Reverberations, accompanied by violinist Niv Ashkenazi, creators Donnie Silver Simons and Michelle Green Wilmer, will discuss the making of their powerful multi-sensory work exploring deception during the darkest of times inspired by Kristallnacht of 1938. These programs like today's will be streaming live on the library's YouTube and Facebook pages. Now on to LA Made. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. For today's LA Made program, we are very pleased to welcome photographer Jonna Ireland as she discusses famed Los Angeles architect Paul R. Williams, the first Black member of the American Institute of Architects, among many other achievements, and her project to photograph his built works around Southern California. 280 of her photos were recently published in her book regarding Paul R. Williams, A Photographer's View, which can be purchased online through the library store. Jonna Ireland was born in Philadelphia and attended the NYU Tisch School of the Arts for her undergraduate degree and UCLA for her Master's of Fine Arts. Her, her photographs have been published in Aperture, The New Yorker, Harper's, Vice, and the Los Angeles Times. Her artwork is also a part of the collections of the, of the California African American Museum, LACMA, and the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. Her project to study and photograph Paul R. Williams' built, built works in Southern California began in 2016, and we are so excited to have Jana here today to discuss both her photographs and Paul R. Williams. So I'll hand it over to Jana. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alice, and thank you to all of you who are in the audience watching this. I really appreciate that you took time out of your day to come hear me talk about my work. I hope that you enjoy my presentation. This is the first time I'm giving this particular presentation and talking about this work that I've been doing in this way. So it'll be an adventure for me and I hope it is an adventure for you as well. So I'm gonna jump into my presentation and start talking about Williams's life and his work and my work about him. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, as Alice said, my book is called Regarding Paul R. Williams, A Photographer's View. It's a title that gets Paul Williams' name in there right away so that you know that it's about this architect, but that also talks about the fact that it's my interpretation of his work. So I'm not an architect or an historian or a biographer. I'm an artist who's interpreting this architect's work and trying to look at it in a way that makes sense to me and that hopefully changes the way other people are looking at his work. Something someone said to me really early on as I was showing this work for the first time is that as a Paul Williams fan who was used to driving around the city and looking at his structures from the outside, something that was interesting about my work was that it provided the opportunity to really look at these structures from the inside and get an intimate view of them. So that's what I'm trying to do here in this work. Here is a photograph of Paul Revere Williams. Paul Williams was born in 1894 right here in Los Angeles. He did projects all over the world, but most of them that survived, most of them were, that were ever built were right here in the Los Angeles area or in other places in Southern California. He retired in 1973 and he practiced for 50 years. So there was 
an enormous amount of time between when he began working and when he retired. And that meant that he saw LA through a lot of different phases and was able to be part of the development of Los Angeles. Beginning his career in the early 1920s meant that when he was first working as an architect, there were so many opportunities for him to build his practice and build his reputation because there was so much land to be built upon. As Alice mentioned, he uh, was the first black member of the American Institute of Architects. He was also the first black AAA fellow and the first black recipient of the AAA gold medal, which he was awarded posthumously in 2017. So a long time after he died, he received this honor. And it's only in recent years, right around the time that I started working on this project and right around the time that he was awarded that medal, that more and more people have begun to appreciate his work and seek it out and talk about it. And this is an exciting time to be a fan of his work and an exciting time to be learning about his work. Last year, his archives were jointly acquired by USC and the Getty Research Institute. And eventually those records will be digitized and that will mean that people who wouldn't have had access to information about Paul Williams other than what's available online and in a few books can suddenly begin to really dive into his work. And I'm so excited to see all of the new scholarship that comes out of this work becoming available to a wide range of people. My book is arranged more like a fine art photography book than like a traditional architectural photography book. And what that means is that the images are arranged without consideration for chronology or for location. So a picture of a building in Las Vegas might be right next to a picture of a house in uh, San Bernardino County in my book. So I'm sort of arranging it in a way that feels natural to me. But for people who are looking at the book and trying to get a really clear view of certain structures, there isn't necessarily that opportunity in the book. It means flipping back and forth and doing some detective work. So in this presentation, what I wanna do is actually talk about specific structures kind of all at once so that you can look at views of them together and get more of a picture of what each one looks like. This photograph is of his house. He designed it for himself and his wife in the Lafayette Square neighborhood of Los Angeles. He's so well known for his grand Hollywood houses and many of them borrow from really traditional architectural styles or uh, replicate traditional architectural styles. But his own house is pretty modern. It's in the international style. And I think that that is a really interesting statement about his personal taste, as well as a statement about the range and his capabilities. And I think if an architect is designing a house for himself, it has to be a statement about his interests and, um, what he is thinking about, what he is most excited to try. One thing Williams is really well known for is his use of curves and you can see them all over this house. So in that last photograph, there was a curve on the outside of the, the house. In this photograph, you can see a curve right above his staircase. And here's another one of that curve. So you can see that there are kind of two of them that come together. Here you can see the same curve in the background, but in the foreground there is um, this diagonal line and these hexagons in this kind of soft ceiling. I love the difference in texture and the contrast in shapes in this particular section of the house. And here's another view of the, that same area of the house, which is a sliding glass door that separates one room from another. This is upstairs in the dressing area of his bedroom. And here's a little detail that I really love. There is an upstairs a wraparound porch and there is this little W on the screen door there for Williams. 
And I just thought that that was a special thing that he did that probably only he and his wife and members of his family would really see. I would imagine that most of the entertaining that went on in the house happened downstairs. So that W was really something that was private. This is a house that he designed in the Hancock Park neighborhood. It was built in 1935. He designed a number of homes in Hancock Park. This isn't the first one, but it's the first one that I had a chance to photograph. In addition to being known for his curves, Williams is well known for his dramatic staircases. And I thought that this was an excellent example of that. Here is that same staircase from another angle, and this is actually the cover of my book. He did a lot of work in Hancock Park. The neighborhood was being developed in the early 1920s, which is right when he began his architectural practice. So it was one of those places in the LA area where there was a lot of opportunity for him, where he could build a house and then a potential neighbor could see that house and say, this is what I want, or I want this architect, or I want something similar. So he was able to influence the development of the neighborhood in that way. And all over Los Angeles, things like that were going on with his work. In a more developed city with less available land and or a city with less money to spend on building new structures, there wouldn't have been so many opportunities for him to succeed. So the fact that he was able to do all of this has to do with his talent, of course, but also with being in the right place at the right time in a lot of senses. But in other senses, of course, he was in the wrong place. Hancock Park was one of those neighborhoods that had a restrictive covenant that meant that the only people who could live there were white people. And when Hancock Park was set up, the restrictive covenant was supposed to last for 50 years. So it wouldn't have expired until the early 1970s. But in 1948, Nat King Cole and his wife bought a house in Hancock Park and the law upheld their right to do so and to live there. The neighbors tried to buy the, the Cole family out. And when they wouldn't take the money, uh, the neighbors just harassed them for years and years. But now the local post office is named after Nat King Cole. So you can see how things change, but it hasn't actually been very long. Cole and his family didn't live in a Williams house, but I'm sure some of the people who wanted that family out of the neighborhood did live in Williams's house, Williams's houses. I think that thinking about Williams's work there and the experience that the Cole family had there really lays bare some of the ugliness that was going on in the city and some of the hypocrisy. While we are on the subject of singers, this is a house that Paul Williams designed for Julie London in Encino. It was built in the late 1950s. I was really excited to photograph a house in Encino because years ago when I was in grad school, I spent a lot of time photographing my husband's grandfather's house in Encino. So when I think about the beginnings of my interest in architecture and in photographing architecture, I think about Encino. And I believe that my husband's family moved to Encino the same year that this house was built. Here's another from that house and you get a little peek at the grand staircase here. And here's another one. As a general rule in shooting this work, I'm trying to avoid showing you all of the things that are in the house. So I'm trying to avoid looking at art and furniture but sometimes it slips in, as in this picture of this lovely fireplace in this particular house. And this is my favorite spot from this house. And one of my favorite spots from any of the houses I visited, this original mirrored dining room. So I had to stand very carefully in this room, uh, not to get myself or my tripod in. 
Stepping outside of LA for a minute, this house is in Ontario, California. Like Williams' own house, it's more modern than the work that Williams is usually associated with. This house was built in 1948, so right around the time he was building the house for himself and his wife, a couple years before. This was the late 40s. His house was built in the very early 50s. When I visited in 2018, this house was only on its second owner. And the person who owned the house at the time and who let me in and took me around and told me the story of the house, actually drove past the house and fell in love with it and knocked on the door and met the original owner, this doctor who was still living there and very elderly at the time, and made a deal with him that he could move into the house after he, the original owner, died. So that's what happened. And this person moved in and kept everything exactly as it was. And that means the original furniture is there. The original art is there. Even vintage magazines were in this house. So it was basically a perfect time capsule. Often when you go into these houses, even the ones that are the most well-preserved will have the kitchen and the bathrooms redone. But this house, except for the windows in the back, which were no longer up to code and had to be replaced, everything is just like it was uh, when the family first moved into it a very long time ago. Sometimes a great house falls into the hands of someone who can't appreciate it for what it is and wants to make big changes that alter the character of it. But in the best situations, a house comes under the stewardship of someone who really appreciates it and respects it and loves it. And that's kind of what happened here. But when I visited the house, it was on the market and it has since sold. So I'm hoping that the new owner of the house really understands it and wants to keep it as close as possible to the way it was when I saw it and the way it was when it was built. This house has a historical designation, which means that there's only so much that can be changed. And it's one of the few Williams structures I've visited that has that kind of protection. And this is just one of my favorite details from the house. You can see that this lovely texture continues from the outside of the house right into the house and is only broken out by that pane of glass. I just thought that was really lovely. On several occasions, Williams actually had the opportunity to design all of the houses in a particular community. This is a shot from the Seaview community in Rancho Palos Verdes, which was developed in the early 1960s. If you look very carefully in the back left of the frame, way out over the ocean, you can see Catalina. A few of the houses in this tract have been replaced since they were built in the 60s, but in its original condition, this tract contained 190 Paul Williams houses. And I recently had someone who grew up in Seaview confirm for me that all of the houses that you can see in this photograph are Williams houses, which is something that I was very happy to hear. Williams designed eight different floor plans for this neighborhood, and each floor plan could be flipped, which meant that each homeowner who was considering buying attractive land and putting a Williams house down on it had 16 possible layouts to choose from. And I had to go without a guide and couldn't definitively identify each of the 16 different floor plans. So these 16 houses kind of represent those 16 different floor plans, although I'm sure there are some repeats in there. I unknowingly visited on trash day and almost all of these houses had big heavy bins of trash and recycling and lawn waste in front. So I had to drag the bins out of the way to take the photographs and then put them back when I was done. I have two little kids and that means that if I have a day to get out to Rancho Palos Verdes to shoot, that's it, it's a day and it very hard to get back out there. So I have to make the most of any opportunity to take these photographs. These houses are in 
Carver Manor, a tract of 250 William, Williams homes in the Willowbrook section of South Los Angeles. I had less time to shoot that day, so you'll see that there are a few trash bins here and there that I didn't have time to move out of the way. This neighborhood was developed by a black real estate agent named Velma Grant, who came up with the idea to build single family homes for black families. And because of World War II, black families who may not have had an opportunity to get a mortgage before could do so through the VA. So she actually built three different tracks. And this is the, I believe the very first one. She hired Williams to design and she named it Carver Manor after the scientist George Washington Carver. So both of those things together really communicated, I think, to people who were seeing the ads or hearing about these houses, who they were for and what kind of neighborhood she was trying to develop. There was less of a budget for these homes than there was for Seaview, which was designed about 15 years later. But even though the houses couldn't have as many bells and whistles, Williams really worked to make sure that each floor plan had kind of an individual personality and could really be customized. So if you visit this neighborhood, you don't feel like you're in a suburb where every house is exactly the same. You feel like you're on a street where all of the houses fit together and look good together, but that each one has its own individual personality. And something that I think is really important to note about Williams is that he wasn't just designing for those wealthy white clients. He did a lot of work in the black community, projects like this one. He did quite a lot of work for middle-class people, projects like this. Even Seaview was sort of a middle-class project. And he did lots of projects for poor people as well. He did uh, public housing projects, for example, and community buildings for people way down on the economic spectrum. So he was really designing for people with a lot and people with very little. A really well-known building that he designed for the black community in LA is this building, the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Building, which was built in 1949. For years, Golden State Mutual was the largest black owned insurance company in the Western United States. And this is a company that gave home loans and life insurance to clients who would likely have been kept out of establishments that were run by and for white people. And the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company also built up an enormous collection of art by black artists. So it was supporting the community in a number of ways. Here is the building that he designed for the Founders Church of Religious Science. Before this building was built, the church operated um, out of a theater. So he had the opportunity to give this congregation their first permanent home and the church is still based there. Here is the Guardian Angel Cathedral in Las Vegas, which was built in the early 1960s. A person who owned a casino wanted uh, one place for all of his Catholic employees to be able to go to worship. So he had this cathedral built for them. Here is a shot from Hillside Memorial Park, which is a Jewish cemetery in Culver City. So this, the structure that I'm standing inside of with my camera is the mausoleum, which Williams designed. And the structure that you see through the doors was designed by Williams as well. That's the Al Jolson Memorial for the actor Al Jolson. This was done in the early 1950s. And here is a picture of the building that he designed for his own church the first African Methodist Episcopal Church of Los Angeles. So he was designing for people of lots of different religions as well. The structures that I've talked about and shown you so far have been success stories in that they're still standing and are still useful to individual families or to communities. But as I was preparing my materials to submit to my book publisher, 
I became really interested in looking at structures that didn't survive for various reasons. This is from a house in Malibu that was built in 1952 and burned down in 1982. And one of those wildfires that we have every year here in Southern California. And here's another shot from that house. This is actually open to the public. It's in Solstice Canyon. So if you're interested in taking a look, you can drive out there and, and climb up a hill and see this for yourself. It's kind of amazing to see what is still left of this house after almost 40 years. Here is a shot from what used to be a Paul Williams house in Toluca Lake. This house was purchased with the understanding that it would be preserved. And then the new owners knocked it down before the neighbors could prevent it. So I think that was a pretty devastating event for the community. I visited right after the house was demolished. So when I went, there were still people um, with big trucks scooping things out of the ground. And there was just kind of a big crater where the house used to be and rubble everywhere. This is from a house in Holmby Hills that has a similar story where it was purchased for someone who decided to, uh, purchased by someone who decided to just destroy the house and deal with the fallout from the city and the community later. And when I visited, they had just knocked the facade of the house off and the city of Los Angeles had ordered that work be, that work be stopped on the house. So it was just kind of sitting there in limbo. I'm not sure what has happened to it since then. I, it's my understanding that it's too damaged to be restored, but I'm waiting to be able to get back out and take a look at it and see what state it's in now. There are about 280 photographs in this book, as Alice mentioned, and they're from dozens of structures, most of them still standing, some of them destroyed like this one. But I'm still so interested in Williams's work and there's still so much of it. The number that usually gets thrown out when talked about the volume of Williams's work is 3,000 projects. So that includes structures that are still standing, structures that are that have been torn down, structures that were joint projects with other architects and structures that were never built. So hopefully being able to gain access to his archives will shed some light on what some of those numbers are and will also help people who are interested in his work identify structures that have kind of slipped through the cracks with so much volume it's been impossible to figure out where all of the Paul Williams houses are and you really have to rely on someone at someone really uh, understanding that they have something that's special and then telling the next person who purchased the house that they have a Paul Williams house and then that person telling the next person. So I'm hoping that more of that information becomes available to all of us. And over the summer, right before the book came out, I had the opportunity to photograph a Paul Williams house in Ojai, California. I wanted to photograph the work in color for the first time. So I've just been sitting with this new color work for a while, trying to figure out where it could fit in with the rest of the work or whether it's a different thing altogether and what might be next for the project. My book materials were due in February and then the pandemic hit. And so there weren't any opportunities to go out and photograph William structures anymore. And for a while that felt very final. It felt like, okay, I can't take any more of these pictures and my book materials are in, the book is coming out, maybe that's it. But getting back out there felt really good and in that time period between me turning in the book and the book coming out, that announcement about USC and the Getty getting his archives was made. And that meant that suddenly there were all of these new possibilities. Here's just another one from that house. 
So the work just kind of keeps pulling me in. I do lots of other kinds of work in photography, but this is something that for now, I guess it stands on its own. I'm trying to figure out how it fits in with the rest of my practice as someone who is not an architectural photographer, as I said at the beginning, and doesn't know very much about architecture and is using this project to learn about architecture as I photograph it. Some images from this house in Ojai are currently on view at the Carolyn Glasso Bailey Foundation building in Ojai. Uh, we, they are on the outside windows and the Carolyn Glasso Bailey Foundation actually sponsored my trip out to Ojai to photograph this house in the first place. The foundation director and I wanted it to be a show that uh, was designed with the pandemic in mind. So the Williams pictures are on the outside windows and then you can kind of go and peek in and see most of the rest of the work in the show. So you can make an appointment to go see it, but if you happen to be nearby, you can also just stop by anytime and see most of the work in the show. Um, my family and I are still pretty isolated, so I actually haven't seen the show yet, but it was really fun to put together and to make this new work and think about it and also to see my Williams work next to some of my other work for the first time. Inside the building are some photographs that I've been taking just around my house and of my family in this last year that I've been home almost all of the time. So I could keep talking about my work and keep talking about my experience of photographing his buildings for a long time, but I want to make sure that I am respectful of your time. So I just want to close my presentation by reading a little bit of my introduction. Here's my book. So I have a background in creative writing. Uh, it's something that I did a lot of as a kid and I was a writing major in high school. I never really uh, pursued writing beyond that before undertaking this big project. So it's still, writing is still something I'm, I'm working on. I'm not, I'm not a writer, but it was really a pleasure to be able to uh, write about this work. I'll just read a tiny bit about it. So far, I have photographed over two dozen Williams structures intimately and a few dozen more superficially from the street. The first Williams building I photographed, a handsome mid-century ranch style house in LA's G Park neighborhood, turned out not to have been designed by Paul Williams at all. I learned from the architect Frank Escher that the house was designed by Claude Coyne, a partner at Paul R. Williams and Associates. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. I continue to be stunned by the generosity of those whose homes I visit. So many people have given me so much of their time and attention. I am grateful for the hours of labor performed, invisible to me before my arrival. Floors scrubbed, mirrors polished, clutter tucked away. I am thankful for the people I have come to know, the married pair of movie producers with a breathtaking art collection, the set of kindly Gen X lawyers with three kids and some amazing LA punk memorabilia, the college professor with a fascinating background in entertainment and politics, the granddaughter diligently tending to the family home. These people, house proud and justifiably so, welcome me and let me see how they live. I spent two and a half years patiently waiting to be granted access to the home Williams designed for himself and his wife, a sleek white international style house that resembles a futuristic riverboat run aground in the middle of Los Angeles. I gained entry to a house once owned by William Holden, later by Denzel Washington, when the current homeowner spied me through a window as I tried to take a clandestine picture from across the street. As soon as I said Paul Williams, his look of suspicion turned to one of warmth and understanding. I have scoured Zillow listings for Williams houses and cold called real estate agents. I've been introduced to property owners via friends of friends of friends. On several occasions, Williams homeowners read about my work somewhere, sought out my contact information, and invited me over. There are sites that turned out to be great disappointments and others that exceeded all expectations. There are also my white whale houses, 
beauty sees owners I unsuccessfully courted for months. I still hope to get to those someday. It is not the beauty of Williams's work that inspires me, though it does bring me a lot of pleasure. It is the thought of him grinding day after day in this city, patiently building his practice and proving his detractors wrong that makes me return to his work. My photographs of Williams's buildings are as much a tribute to his labor and persistence as they are a tribute to his talent. I am proud to live and work in Paul Williams's city. If Williams could become one of the most notable architects of the 20th century here, what could my children become in the 21st? This is a fascinating time to live in Los Angeles, though I suppose that can be said of any moment in the city's history. A city can change so fast. Tracking Williams's work is my way of making sense of the sprawling, fascinating place I call home. Paul Williams was a faithful citizen of Los Angeles who used his abundant gifts to change the face of the city. Los Angeles has changed without him and will continue to change in unknown ways, but his mark is indelible. Los Angeles is known as a city that likes to forget its history, but it will always remember Paul Revere Williams. And now, Alice, if you're there. Hello. <laughs> Hi, it's John. Oh, thanks so much. That was really wonderful. And um, one of the questions I had personally was where the project like how it had changed over time. And it's really interesting to see what you're going to be doing with it in the future. And we have a lot of questions. One thing that was kind of interesting is um, I believe that someone here in the comments owned that house in Malibu that burned down. And she was talking about that. Um, yeah, the Solstice Canyon, Canyon one in Malibu. Is that the one you, is that the one you photographed? Yes. Yeah, so that was kind of interesting, yeah. So she I'd love to talk to you about the house. You can email me, it's all online, please do. Um, yeah, if you, um, and Jana's contact information is on her website too, if you wanted to get to contact her. And then we have a lot of questions too. Um, let's see, the first one was if you could ask um, Paul Williams any questions, what would, what would you ask him if you were able to meet with him? One thing that I think about a lot is how his work relates to the work of the really prominent white architects at the same time who were designing things in really distinctive styles so that you could uh, say, oh, that's a Frank Lloyd Wright house right there. Or, oh, that's a Schindler house right there. And he had to have, he had to be more flexible than that. He had to be able to design in all of these different styles. So I think I would ask him if he had the opportunity to develop that distinctive style, what that would have looked like, and um, you know what what he could have done if he were given that same opportunity. And I, one of the reasons I'm so interested in his house is that I think it offers a little clue about where his interests in architecture lay and where his ambitions in architecture might have been. Yeah, that kind of relates to another question was, um, was Paul Williams given free range on the design of his buildings or did he work closely with the client? But that kind of relates to what you were saying. It depends on the project. He had clients who wouldn't shake his hand because, or sit next to him uh, when he was drafting their house for them because he was black. So there were clients he had very little to do with. And then there were opportunities where he could design for friends of his. And I think that would have been a much more intimate experience and an experience where he had a lot more freedom. So it, it, it really varies. He had some, I, he had some opportunities to do it, but there were other places where he was more constrained. Yeah, it was interesting to hear you talk about his own house and how it was a different style than the one, many of the ones he designed. No one he's known for. He's known for these these grand Hollywood houses, but he did so many more things than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even his title is like Architect of the Stars, but I really like that your book gets into like all the different kinds of projects that he did. Many of them. There's still I there are still so many more. If I keep going with this, I mean it could go forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then I think there were a couple other questions too about um, your process. One person was asking, um, why did you choose to photograph um, the houses in the book largely in black and white versus color? And then I guess maybe another question, because then I think later then you are switching to colors, maybe a little bit about that. 
all the photographs in the book are in black and white with the exception of a photograph that I included from another project of, of um, myself and my family just to, a, to get my children into my book so they can always see themselves in it and B, to just hint at the fact that this isn't the only kind of work that I do, that there are other interests that I have. So I wanted this work to be in black and white initially because it seemed like a good way to unify all of these different kinds of structures and all of these different styles made over the course of 50 years. So there are all kinds of trends in uh, carpets and wallpaper and furniture that have, uh, taken place or in the last hundred years. So his career began in 1923 and it's now 2021. So some of these structures have had about a hundred years for people to impose their personal taste on. And I wanted to find a way to strip a lot of that out and just show you the structure that's underneath and show you Williams's hand. This is not a question that anyone else asked, but it's a question I had. <laughs> I was wondering, a lot of times you focused on things that, um, you know, like very small details that architectural photographers often miss. And I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about, about that. I'm coming to this work from a different background, from a fine art background, which feels like a really silly thing to say out loud. But it means that um, when I am taking a picture of a house, I'm not really interested in showing you what the whole living room looks like. I'm not interested in taking a picture that uh, will sell a house. I'm interested in all of these little things. So I go into a new space and I'm looking for where the light is falling and how the corners of a room come together and all those little things. And that's just a reflection of the way I am looking at these structures versus the way someone who is trying to show off uh, an entire structure would be photographing it. Yeah, that's definitely the sense. It's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting book because it's like you do feel like a, you're walk like the reader feels like they're walking with you through the structures and it's very interesting. And then another person, I don't know if you would know the answer to this because I don't know if it's, it's if there's a source, but um, one person was asking, um, you, you showed the photo of the Al Jolson Memorial, and one person was wondering if you know what his thoughts were given Jolson's famous use of blackface, but I'm not sure if that's, if some, that's something you would know or not. I don't know his thoughts, but I do have my own thoughts about it, um, which is that there is a certain irony in it, but that we also have to be cognizant of the fact that Al Jolson was one of the most famous entertainers of his time, and he considered his blackface performances a tribute, and he was someone who saw himself as an ally to the black community. So while we look at his work now, and it's really horrifying and offensive, it was saying something different at the time. And that means that though the same ironies were present, they were probably less uh, not talked about as much when talking about the work. And it's, it's now something that we're thinking a lot more about now. So I have no way of knowing how Williams would have felt about it. But I would, my thought is that even knowing the work that he's known for, the opportunity to design the final resting place, this grand mausoleum for one of the biggest stars of his time was, uh, was a really special one. And then another person was asking, um, if you've had any issues, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about this, but if you've had any issues with owners when you're trying to photograph the properties, are there any that you've been, um, haven't had access to yet or were denied access to so far? There have been some I haven't managed to get into, either the timing never works out or someone is maybe not entirely comfortable with having me photograph a house or they're not sure it's a Paul Williams house and I can't figure out how to confirm whether it is or tell them that it's not or they just never get back to me. There are a few structures, um, in particular public buildings that I've tried to get into and I've just sort of gotten lost in an answering machine or an email inbox somewhere. Yeah. I would, yeah, <laughs> to me, I, I, yeah, I don't envy you with 3000 properties and trying to get <laughs> hold of all those people. Um, but it's really, it's an interesting undertaking and I admire, I admire all the work that must go into it. Um, 
And then um, there's a couple other people that had just had questions about different houses. Um, if you visited Lon Chaney's house or Barbara Stanwyck's house, and I'm not sure if you have photographed them yet or if you are planning to or ho hopefully want to. Uh, I photographed Lon Chaney's house from the outside. I haven't had the opportunity to photograph it inside yet. So if you know someone, let me know. Um, Barbara Stanwyck's house, I believe, is that ranch out in Northridge. And it's one that I would really like to get to. Um, it has an interesting history for a while. It was owned by USC. Oh, it's somewhere oh, there. It is. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm not sure whose hands it is in now or what condition it's in now, but I am definitely interested in it. And then I think the last question was, um, are you working with the LA Conservancy at all for your project? I am not, but I'm open to talking to all kinds of people about this work. Yeah. As I've said, it really has the potential to go on for a long time. And it has, there with the archives um, now being available, I would love to work with some other people who are interested in his work and who are doing research into his work that I'm not capable of. I can do the thing I can do, but I would love to be part of a larger effort to uh, conserve his work and identify his work and, and look at his work. And then there's another question about um, the Botany Building at UCLA. Um, if you've, I don't know if you've had a chance to visit that one or... I have not. I've heard a little bit about it. I know that they recently um, created a mural that was related to his original plans for the Botany Building. The only thing I photographed on UCLA's campus is France Hall Number 2, which is a building, a, just a a regular school building that he designed that's there on campus. And then um, I guess my last question then would be, um, you probably said this during your presentation, but I might've forgotten. Um, what was your favorite building to walk through that so far that you've visited of his? I think, I don't know if I have a favorite, but I do have experiences that really stand out. One is that house in Ontario that was uh, straight from the 1950s. Another was Hillside Memorial Park. I showed you a little bit about that. Um, just one photograph from it, but it's the rare structure that I visited twice. So I got to see it in a couple different years and with a couple of different levels of access to it. So it was interesting to just photograph it superficially and then gain access to the whole thing and really be able to spend a lot of time there. And I think the house in Malibu was really special as well. Um, this house that uh, was private for a while and then burned down and is kind of slowly returning to nature and is something that people can actually see. And there's a little uh, plaque there that has information about him. So it's one of the places that you can go in the LA area and just kind of spontaneously read about his work as you are going about your day. And I think that's really special. And maybe something we'll be able to do more of as his contributions to the city are recognized more and more in the years to come. That's that's really that's really interesting. I, it's interesting to see the photos and to learn that you can go there and see this kind of like burned house and then read it. That's that's it's fun that they kept it, I guess, there at least as a memorial to the house and what he did there. I think so too. So I think that's all the questions. Oh, there is just one little question about. Um, Jane Wyman's house. So I think everyone just has kind of their questions about different houses they know that he, that he designed. That is that, um, was she, who am I thinking of? Was she Ronald Reagan's first wife? I think she was, yes. She that was house, I actually know the granddaughter of the previous owners of that house and tried to get into it for years. And the owners of it, I don't know, just were not responsive and the house was recently sold and there was an estate sale and I wanted to go to it so badly, but I was photographing something on the other side of the city that day and I just couldn't get back in time and I had to relieve my husband because he was looking after the kids. And so I still haven't seen it, but I, I've passed by it and thought about it a great deal and sent many emails related to it. If it's the same house that, that you're talking about. Yeah, this, that, well, hopefully someday you'll get to, maybe the owners will have a change of heart or the new owners. Um. 
And then another person asked, this is a good question to end with, um, do you ever feel a sense of sacredness when you enter one of his buildings? Hmm. I think that um, there was that section at the end of my presentation where I showed you the Founders Church and his own church and a few other structures that are directly tied to religions. And I think there is sort of a, something built into those, but I try not to, how can I put this? There's only so much that I know about his life. So I'm not trying to mythologize him in the way that I photograph these spaces. So I try to approach them in a way that has that respects them for what they are, but is also really practical. I don't know if that's a, that's, I'll think more about that question. I, I, I can't get it done right now. I think that it's something that I felt, but it's not something that I'm consciously looking for. Maybe that's the answer. Well, thanks very much, Anna. And then um, I know people were asking also about the link and um, I think we're gonna put it there in the chat again. And that was just a wonderful presentation. It was so interesting to learn more about him and your process. And it's a great book. This is a copy. I also have a copy of the book. <laughs> so it's a great book. It's sold at the library store and um, there's the link for it. And let me just see. So just um, thanks very much, Anna. Mm -hmm. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org for our next LA Made program, which will be Thursday, January 28th at 4 p.m. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye everybody. Bye.